in this video, I'm going to answer a question that I've been kind of putting off uh, for, for a couple weeks now. And so the, the question is very nicely stated in the headline here. Uh, how large is sufficiently large? So to kind of put this into context, ever since we talked about the central limit theorem, uh, what I said was, well, uh, if we have a, a, a mean from some sample, um, that sample mean will be approximately normal provided our sample size is sufficiently large. And I've, I've, uh, I've kind of dodged, uh, well, well, what exactly does sufficiently large mean? Um, the one exception to this is, is um, the normal approximation of the binomial. So with the normal approximation of the binomial, we had, uh, you know, very specific guidelines on what sufficiently large meant. So recall that there were some rules of thumb. Uh, if n, um, n times pi is greater than 5 and n times 1 minus pi is bigger than 5, then that normal approximation is supposed to work pretty well. All right, so, so that, that, that's a very concrete answer to the sufficiently large question. Now, re remember what I, I said about those conditions, n times pi and n times 1 minus pi being bigger than 5, were meant to guard you or protect you against skewed distributions. So if you have a very skewed distribution, in the case of a 0, 1 distribution, um, it's going to be very skewed if you have a, either a very small percentage or a very large percentage. Um, and what happens if you have a very small percentage? Well, then n times pi, um, you know, being bigger than 5 would require a much bigger n. You know, so if, if, uh, if you had a, a pi of... of um, of 0.5 as an example. All you need is a sample size of 10 for that to work, because 10 times 0.5 is 5. On the other hand, if pi is only 1%, well, then you're going to need a much, much larger sample size um, for the normal approximation to work. So, the lesson we've learned from the normal approximation of the binomial is uh, beware of skewed distributions. Okay, now let's, let's try to answer this uh, more generally for non-dichotomous distributions. To do so, I went to Siegel and pulled a quote. So this is what Siegel has to say on the topic. So how large is large enough? Well, if the, if the distribution of individuals is not too skewed, so here we go with skewness again, uh, n equal to 30 is generally sufficient. However, if the distribution is extremely skewed or has large outliers, n may have to be much larger. If the distribution is fairly close to normal already, then n can be much smaller than 30, say 20, 10, or even 5. And then, of course, if the distribution is normal to begin with, then n equal to 1 is enough. So, in summary, what Siegel is saying is if the distribution is skewed, you're going to need a big sample. Uh, if it's fairly close to normal or at least symmetrical, you know, n can be much, it can be pretty small. Um, just for variety, I, I pulled what uh, Churchill has to say in his marketing research textbook that um, I often use um, as, as a textbook for this course. So if the distribution of the parent population is normal, the means of sample size n equal to 1 will be normally distributed. And that's exactly what, uh, what Siegel said, and of course that's true. Um, if the distribution of the variable is symmetrical but not normal, samples of a very small sample size will produce a distribution in which the means are normally distributed. If the uh, distribution of the variable is highly skewed in the parent population, samples of a much larger size will be needed. All right, so Churchill... Uh, says pretty much the same thing as Siegel. You, you might wonder why I'm showing you these two books. Um, a lot of stats books don't get this right. They get really sloppy about it. Uh, both Siegel and Churchill are very careful writers who know what they're, who, who know their stuff, and that's why um, you, you get the straight story from from them. All right, here, here's some little um, practice questions for you to deal with in class. We'll um, go over this and perhaps um, do a, an interactive discussion uh, in the distance learning class. So we can put the, that, that, what Siegel and Churchill just told us uh, to good use.
now I'd like to shift a little bit to talking about uh, detecting normality. So how, how do you know if a, if a distribution is normal? Well, the way we're going to do this is to use something called a normal probability plot if you want to get really um, you know, sophisticated about this. Uh, I'll show how to generate one of these normal probability plots in another video using software. All right, so what I've done to, to kind of help us get our arms around interpreting a normal probability plot is to generate some distributions. So here is a uniform distribution. I generated a lot of data from a uniform distribution. This is a normal probability plot. So what you'll see there are, is one point for every observation. And then you have a line here. If all the points fall in that line, you have a normal distribution. Because what you're really doing is plotting the, quanti the empirical quantiles of your data against those from a z-table. All right, so if you... Um, if it is normal, the things will fall in a line. If the quantiles don't match up, um, then you get something else. All right, so the fact that these tails are really thick, the really thick tails, not much in the middle, um, is reflected in this normal probability plot. The fact that these points don't fall in the line means you don't have a normal distribution. Now here's a distribution that's skewed. And if you look at your normal probability plot, it's, um, they're not following the line, so that's indicating that you've got um, a deviation from normality. Let's look at another one. This is a pretty good distribution. Um, and what you'll see is that everything pretty much falls on the, on the line with the exception of a couple points out there in the tails that, that don't quite match up. But this is a pretty normal, normal curve. I generated another distribution that's perfectly normal, but then I stuck in one outlier. And so what you'll see is that all the points fall in the line, indicating that's all normal with the exception of that one outlier, and the outlier shows up pretty clearly in the normal probability plot. Now, um, another question that you might have is, what happens if n is not sufficiently large? You know, so what, what, what goes wrong? And so to, so to answer that question, I thought I would run a little simulation study. So here's what I did. I generated four distributions. Let me show you those, those four distributions. So let's start out with the easiest of those distributions. The upper right is a normal distribution. Okay, so we generated data from a perfect normal distribution. Um, the other three distributions are not normal, um, and they, they vary quite a bit. So the nastiest of these distributions is that how many times have you been to an art museum example that we've uh, discussed quite a bit in this class? And in this example, uh, what you'll see is that, you know, remember we went over this graph earlier um, a couple weeks ago. We had three income groups, high, medium, and low. And uh, so here's the number of times that you visited the art museum. Here are the box plots for those three groups. So what you'll see is the median is zero for all three income groups. So what that means is at least half the data have a value of zero. The third quartile in each case is one. So what that means is at least 75% of the data is one or less. But then you have all these outliers. So you had the, the, the woman who had 52 visits in a year, the man who had 45 visits, and you have other people with 40 and 30 and so forth. All right, so this is a very highly skewed distribution uh, with a lot of outliers. And what would Churchill and Siegel have to say about the convergence of the CLT in this case? Well, it's highly skewed with outliers, so watch out. We would expect the CLT to converge very slowly in this case. I took two other distributions. Uh, what is your income? This was on a, a, a bucketed 12-point scale. So it's moderately right skewed, but because it's in buckets, this last bucket is something like 150 plus. Um, all those outliers get lumped into one bucket and they can't really wreak any havoc that way. So it's fairly right skewed, but no real outliers because of the bucketing. Another question on that survey was, um, 
do you find art museums boring or stimulating on a seven-point semantic differential scale? What you'll see is pretty m modest left skewness. So there's not much, not much skewness going on, but a little bit. So we would expect the CLT to converge um, fairly quickly compared to the income, much more quickly than um, in the case of art museum visits. So we have these four distributions, and what I did was to uh, take my sample and pretend it was a census. So um, that means, you know, I have a record of what everybody in my, you know, quote, population um, said. So if I have the population, the mean of that, then is the true mean and it's the parameter. Then I did the following. I did the following 100,000 times. I decided to draw samples of, of various sizes with replacement from the data so that we meet the assumptions of the test exactly. So I drew samples of size n, drew a sample of size n, and then I tested the null hypothesis mu against the true mean, which I know since I've assumed that this is the, you know, the, uh, the population and I have a census. Then I counted the false positives. All right, so I did this 100 times, and what you should note is that if the test is working, we should have 5,000 false positives where I reject this null hypothesis um, falsely. 95% of the time, I should not be able to reject that. Now, to the extent that the observed rejections do not equal 5,000, that means the test is not working. So, how do we do? Let's start out with the normal distribution. I decided to take uh, samples of size 2 from that curve. Uh, Jen did this 100,000 times, had 5,000 rejections, which means the nominal type 1 error rate is about 5%, which is dead on. You make a 95% confidence interval, notice it covers 5%. So what this tells us is that the test is working for normal distributions just as we would expect. Um, I did, um, I guess I, I, um, I, I, I did another distribution, which is the uniform distribution. So now the uniform distribution recalls flat. Uh, so it's, it's symmetrical. It's um, no nasty outliers. I generated uh, samples of size 10. So if you generate samples of size 10, you get about 5,535 type 1 errors. So the nominal error rate is a little bit high. 95% confidence interval doesn't cover 5%. So that, that's telling you the CLT really isn't, um, isn't, isn't working at this point. You turn it up to 15, and you'll see the 95% confidence interval almost covers 5%. By the time you get to 20, you know, there's no real difference, and you're, you're right on the nominal um, error rate. So as Siegel and Churchill predicted with uniform distributions, uh, samples of a pretty small size will, um, will, will be, be big enough. Now let's look at the art museum boring um, distribution. So this one's a little bit skewed, but not horribly so. We'd expect the CLT to, to uh, converge fairly quickly. Let's just start with a sample of size 5. The nominal error rate's a bit high, well over 6%. By the time you get a sample of 10, it's up to about 6%, not bad. Um, you, have to, you have to go all the way out to 30 or so before the uh, confidence interval doesn't cover 5 uh, The confidence interval covers 5%, pardon me. So um, samples of a fairly small you know, size enable the CLT to converge for this distribution. Now income is somewhat more skewed, so we would expect you know larger sample sizes to be required. And sure enough, that's the case. You don't not until you get out to a hundred does um, the confidence interval cover five percent. Okay, it's close at ninety, but not quite. Um, but you know the point is you 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 need substantially larger sample sizes when you've got even that amount of skewness. Now let's go to the nastiest distribution of them all, which is this, how many times have you been to an art museum, which is, you know, three quarters of your data are zeros and ones, and then you get these 52s out there. 
Um, so with a, with a sample of size 10, the error rate's horrible, 17%. You know, we were kind of complaining up here about five five and a half percent. <laughs> You know, here you're at like 17%. Now, when you um, turn it up to 100, things aren't that much better. Turn it up to 1,000, you're still way over 7%. Turn it up to 5,000, now you're getting close at least. Have a sample of 10,000 from this. Notice the, the confidence interval still doesn't cover 5%. So the point here is um, exactly what Churchill and Siegel told you, uh, beware of skewness and outliers. Your sample size is going to have to be much larger. Now, I did one other thing. Um, remember I said whenever you have a skewed distribution, right skewed distribution, you want to log it. So if you log this distribution and then test the log means, what you're going to see is that you know with a sample of 40, you're close. This one has such nasty outliers. There's still outliers even after you've logged. But by the time you get up to 100-ish, you're getting real close to, um, you know, to, to, to the thing working. So um, logging is a, is a really good way to deal with highly skewed distributions having outliers. And um, so how do you assess normality? So for large data sets, you want to look out for the outliers. Um, if there's outliers, you want to handle them appropriately. If you have skewed distributions, log them, take the square root. Where things get much more complicated is when you have a small sample size. So here you want to look at your normal probability plot. I wouldn't recommend looking at the normal probability plot um, on giant data sets because SPSS will often crash. But for small data sets, you definitely want to look at it. Um, you want to do some significance tests on normality, which I'll cover when I talk, when I do the SPSS video. Um, and that's about it. Okay, so in a second I'll show you in a separate video how to do this in software.